one of the friends of Elizabeth introduced me to, although I'd already met her a little bit before, his name was Don, and uh, he's going to come up for his next. Um, so I don't know if anybody read uh, Sub Rosa, um, came out uh, about 2010. Uh, won the, the Lambda Award, well, you know, which is kind of a, a nice big deal. I don't know. Uh, it is to me, at least. Uh, so, from what I understand, and maybe I'm giving a little bit away from the introduction of, of Amber's book, and maybe you'll explain this. Um, Amber was getting uh, a few comments from readers wondering why she was being so honest about her, about her biography. Um, that maybe... Um, Maybe she thought she needed to rely on, on her past to sell books. Um, and, uh, and Amber's response to that was to embrace the hell out of it and uh, write a pretty staggering uh, collection um, called How Poetry Saved My Life, uh, which is a hybrid memoir of um, poetry, memory, uh, biographical stories. Um, and there are a few pieces in there that I went back to and read over and over again, uh, and that I think if they find the right audience could become, to a certain degree, maybe canonical works um, uh, in what seems to be a, an increasingly presence of queer literature in Canada. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a, um, uh, a piece in there called uh, How to Bury Our Dead, um, in which, uh, in which Amber talks about um, how there's no, there's no ritual for queer funerals, that either um, queer, uh, queer lifestyle of this person is ignored uh, during times of mourning or is amplified and used um, for political means, which neither are necessarily bad things, I guess, although I don't know if I'd say that really about the former. Uh, but in there, Amber says uh, of queer funerals that surely we've earned uh, hours of storytelling. Um, and it feels to me that this is what Amber's done. She shared with us hours uh, of storytelling that is, um, though there are some commiserative moments, uh, is nothing but uh, just a hell of a celebration about uh, her life, the people that she's loved, uh, the people that she loves, uh, and her continuing to do so in life. Uh, so I recommend you pick it up, and I recommend you pick up your ears uh, for Amber coming up for us now. Thanks, Amber. Thank you, Andrew. What an extremely thoughtful introduction. Um, so, so uh, apt of an introduction that I don't feel like I need to say much, but I will quickly say uh, the book is not called How Poetry Augmented My Comfortably Upper Class Lifestyle. Um, and by that I mean some of the, some of the stories and poetry therein um, go, go to some dark and tender places. Uh, but tonight, if you just sort of hang with me, I, I promise to reach those celebratory and loving moments as well. I'm going to read three poems, um, and all in their own right are love poems. I'll begin with How I Got My Tattoo. Every other weekend, I ate green olives, crude slices of cheddar, Ritz crackers, smoked sardines straight from the can with a turnkey lid, garlic pickles. Pepperoni dipped in sour cream, spring onions, and hard-boiled eggs rolled under my father's palm until the shell fell away like lizard skin, then rolled again in a mound of kosher salt, because these are the foods that coalesce with father's recent divorce status and with beer. When I hit my girlfriend Valentine with the phone receiver a decade later, I was dead set on having olives as the complimentary topping on our delivery pizza, she wanted green peppers and belly ached about how we never ate vegetables and we'd stop going for our all-night walks. We only walked those walks, I reminded her, for city to become field or empty parking lot or stretch of quiet railroad where we could kiss each other raw and scream and hide from Bogart Vocational High School and God and daylight. Cocaine is turning you into a fucking asshole, she said and picked olives from her half of the pizza to feed them to me. A few missed my mouth and rolled inside my shirt then onto the golden denim blue floral sofa where we slept, a mess of limbs and unconscious youth. I never lost my appetite as an addict. I'm glad I was a girl and there were horse races and truck stops and 24-hour diners where a girl with a bit of Glitter lip gloss could count on the done with their day men, up and down on their look men, ball busted, broken back men, plain sick of spending time with other men men, 
to offer a grilled cheese sandwich and a bit of pocket money so I didn't have to raid the dumpster behind the Nabisco factory with Petey and Steve. They always smelled like corn syrup. Petey had beautiful eyelashes that hid the bloodshot like a burlesque dancer's feather fans. I would have let him touch me, but his hands were the kind of filthy that won't scrub clean. I wish I could say I've been clean since the day Valentine died. I was living in an artist loft where I made non-wearable ball gowns out of copper wire, old costume jewelry, and crayfish claws I had saved up over the years and spray painted gold. My girlfriend at the time, Jessie, was kind and she always lied when I asked her if my art stank like fish. She had her arms around me before I even hung up the phone. Valentine's little sister told me I was the only one she would call. Me and 911. I returned to my old dealer's house with a Confederate flag hung in the bay window and the stupid smoke that couldn't find its way out of the living room, and I told everyone there Valentine had overdosed in her sister's bathroom, and the funeral was on a Wednesday at Our Lady of Perpetual Forgiveness Church. My skin itched from secondhand free base coke, and I had to go home and take 17 gravel because it was all we had in the medicine cabinet and I wanted to sleep for as many days as humanly possible, but Jessie made me walk in circles around the coffee table for hours before she was sure I wouldn't pass out cold. I quit for good up north in a small village where my host brought down a deer which I volunteered to help them skin and piece the meat. I didn't expect the animal to resist the knife the way it did. Everyone was amused how I struggled with its heavy leg and my lace-trimmed summer dress. They said they had never seen a white girl so willing to get blood on her hands since their land was taken. The children made up words and told me they were first people's words, then laughed hysterically when I tried to repeat these words back to them. I guess without realizing it, I escaped by becoming an outsider. Sure, I've traveled and gotten the kind of attention a girl gets when she is traveling alone. The tattoo on my back has been a means for men and women to initiate conversation or touch, poking at the raised ink peeking out of my shirt collar. Junko approached me in a park in Osaka while I was trying to coax a stray dog to let me pet it and asked me to come for karaoke and drinks. I ordered a cream soda that surprised me by being emerald green. The cartoonish rendition of Valentine, her half-winking eye, her leopard print swimsuit, her halo that was supposed to be gold, but I got too sore for the tattooist to finish the color made Junko ask, why did you get this tattoo? I told her to kiss Valentine's lips, my shoulder. We sang Beatles songs. I feel like the ice is slowly melting, little darling. It seems like years since it's been clear. There are the romances that stick to that song, that baby toe, that particular hue of blue, that constant twister of cherry blossoms in April on the corner of second and Com commercial. Romances that stick to you long after they've ended. And then there are the romances you barely remember at all. They turn up in your memory like a key found in the pocket of an old coat you haven't worn for ages or a phone number scribbled on the last page of the self-help book written by the Buddhist nun from Los Angeles, which you always fell asleep reading, even on the bus, and there is no name written beside that phone number. I don't remember the girl whose father's front yard was strewn with Studebaker and Bugatti skeletons, a battleground of chrome bones, rusted limbs reaching for my ankles as I snuck to her window at night. Her own car was a Galaxy Ford 500, mint green with paler mint interior. No radio, only distance between us, those bucket seats so far apart. The crickets desperate hymn along the black back roads we drove, the sour smell of sumac growing in the ditch, her cigarette smoke floating above her head like a halo that refused to commit to her head, I remember. But not her eyes, her clothes, the words she must have said or didn't. I imagine this girl, now a woman, has forgotten the sterling silver eagle earrings I wore every day that summer, the way August poured freckles on my shoulders and nose, that I worked the snow cone machine at a traveling fair, and if they were going to Montana, I would go with them, 
because I heard there was nothing but fields of sunflowers there. And I loved the long drives, how you can close your eyes, then open, and everything around you has changed. Uh, this is my last poem, and it, it's more of a love of activism and direct action and the feminism that sort of raised me up. Uh, it's called, And We Did. I have stood naked on the art gallery steps. We were 100 strong lesbians. We seized the food court at Pacific Center Mall to disrupt the heteronorm with an anti-homophobia kiss in. I have kissed pavement while an officer handcuffed me and others searched my bra and underpants for alleged weapons. No one read me my rights. No weapons were found. Our rubber-soled boots tracked red footprints down the highway on-ramp. Vaseline will break down spray paint stains on skin. Share this information. Our mark the next morning. Shame, stop, smash, the state vote no. Yes, now, revolution. We ate pepper spray. We saw riot tanks rush London on Financial Fool's Day. I have torn a sleeve from my blouse and used it to bind an open wound. Once, I sat in a cake at a charity ball where the mayor was in attendance. Before the internet, we found each other in the streets like swallows who find their way home each summer. How did we know? We linked arms, a human chain. We chanted the people, united, will never be defeated. We were young, so certain we would change the world. We were young, so certain we would change the world. The people united will never be defeated, we chanted. A human chain, we linked arms. How did we know to find each other like swallows in the summer? Before the internet, we made our home in the streets. I once sat in a cake at a charity ball where the mayor was in attendance. I once tore a sleeve from my blouse and used it to dress an open wound. We saw riot takes rush London on Financial Fool's Day. We ate pepper spray. Shame, stop, smash, the state vote no. Yes, now, revolution, our mark. In the morning, share this information. Vaseline breaks down the spray paint stains on skin and rubber soled boots. We tracked red footprints down the highway on ramp. No one read us our rights. No weapons were found. We have kissed pavement while officers handcuffed us. Others searched our bras and underpants for alleged weapons. We seized the food court at Pacific Center Mall to disrupt the heteronorm with an anti-homophobia kiss and we were 100 strong lesbians. I have stood naked on the art gallery steps. Thank you so much.